and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. COVID-19 continues to ripple out to rural areas, and although the spread has been losing some steam, we are not out of the woods by any stretch. And we know that you have questions about COVID-19 right now, both health-related and, of course, about the future of what's going to happen with this virus. So tonight, we're going to open up our phone lines and give you a chance to talk to the experts. 877-731-6737. Three, three. I'll give you a chance to grab a pencil and give you that number one more time. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. You're a big part of this show. Join the conversation. We are ready to take your calls right now. All right, and joining us tonight, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center and world-renowned doctor, we have Jeffrey Gold. And joining us a little bit later, Nebraska Lieutenant Governor Mike Foley. He's a busy man, but he will be joining us soon. They are both live at the University of Nebraska Omaha tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. We have a lot to cover. Let's get right to it, Dr. Gold. Let's start with an overview of how COVID-19 is impacting rural America right now. Sure. Well, Christina, as uh, I'm most sure most of our audience knows, uh, the numbers still continue to go up uh, around the world and, of course, uh, here in the United States. Uh, we crossed the 6.29 million case uh, worldwide, and the rate of growth of the spread of the virus worldwide uh, continues to increase on a daily basis. But here in the United States, we're almost at uh, 1.8 million confirmed cases, and uh, just over 104,000 uh, deaths. It's hard to believe that those numbers uh, continue to rise. Uh, the good news is <clears throat> that this rate of rise across the United States uh, continues to slightly slow week over week. The bad news is, is that it's slowing more rapidly on the coasts and in the large urban communities than it is in the Midwest uh, and across our rural uh, communities. What we're continuing to see in our rural communities is spread. Uh, we see it uh, in, in long-term care facilities. We see it in, uh, in early childhood uh, daycare facilities. Uh, we're starting to see it, of course, continued in our meatpacking facilities uh, across our rural and urban communities as well. And so these are things that we're following very closely, Christina. I think we've seen a number of states, including our state here in Nebraska, start to significantly loosen up our NPIs, our non-pharmacologic interventions. And so we're kind of holding our breath and watching to see what the impact of that's going to be in the near future. So I look forward to the questions from our audience tonight and continuing this discussion. Absolutely. Let's get right to it, Dr. Gold. And the first question comes from Zachary of Tennessee. Let's listen. I'm hearing a lot about herd immunity, needing to reach herd immunity since a vaccine could take so long. Can you let me know, how close are we? Zachary, that gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the background of herd immunity and what herd immunity is and why it's so important. It's not a new term. It was originally developed at the time that polio and smallpox were major concerns across the United States and around the world. And the question was pretty simple. <clears throat> how many people would have to be immune in order to block the transmission of polio or smallpox, uh, influenza, or in this case, of course, we're talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's look at some of these graphics. The first is a technical definition of what herd immunity is. And herd immunity is actually defined mathematically. And it has to do with, if you're gonna block the transmission from a tra so-called transmitting case to another, how many people would it take? So the percent of the population that it would actually take is expressed as one minus one over R0, and R0 or R0 is the transmission factor. And so what that means, Christina, is that the more contagious a virus is, or any infectious disease, the larger percentage of people have to be immune in order to stop the spread. That all makes common sense. So let's go back to that, that graphic that looked at the idea of if, uh, you know, I'm immune uh, and uh, I get exposed to somebody, uh, I'm going to block the chain of transmission. Uh, if I'm not immune, I'm, gonna, I'm susceptible, I'm going to continue that chain of transmission, <clears throat> then I'll transmit it to somebody else, who will transmit it to somebody else, who will transmit it to yet another person. So the whole idea of herd immunity 
is to create a significant degree of immunity. So what percent of the population? Now we know the number very well for other diseases and we have a graphic that shows measles and, and other typical highly infectious agents. And the idea being uh, pretty simply uh, is that for these types of diseases, it frequently takes between 80 and 90 percent of the population to be able to be significantly immune uh, in order uh, to stop the spread. So you see here for mumps, it's 75 to 86 percent. Uh, for smallpox, it's between 80 and 85 uh, percent. For measles, it's between 83 and 94 percent. Again, <clears throat> for a very highly uh, transmissible disease. Now, we don't really know uh, yet what the real number is for COVID-19, but we're thinking that that number, based upon current disease transmission rates, is going to be somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the population. So uh, that means that roughly two-thirds of the population would have to either be immune due to the presence of a vaccine or, or be immune due to the transmission of the disease and acquiring the disease. Now, given the number of asymptomatic people, we're not 100 percent sure about how many people are actually immune. We've done some research in different communities across the United States and around the world. And so, for instance, in New York City, which we all know was a real epicenter for the spread of COVID, uh, we think mm -hmm. that 19 percent of the population is immune. And that's really the largest number that we have in the United States. <clears throat> Boston uh, is just under 10 percent immune currently. Even from Wuhan City in, the, uh, in China, where this uh, pandemic began, at least to the best of our knowledge, they've done the same type of immunity studies, and they appear to be about 11 percent immune. So I guess in answer to your question, Zachary, we have a really long way to go in order to get sufficient herd immunity to feel comfortable uh, in the spread of, uh, of blocking the spread of uh, COVID-19. So we're going to need to depend on a rapid, uh, accelerated development of a safe and effective vaccine. And we're going to also need to depend on accurate antibody determinations to know if people really are becoming immune, particularly from the non-symptomatic population. Okay. So long-winded answer. <laughs> Finish that thought, please. No, I'm done. Uh, but I, I hope that that at least provided a little bit of background for our audience tonight on what we mean by herd immunity. Oh, absolutely. You know, I was I was shocked by 19 percent in New York City and trying to get that value up to closer to 60 to 70 percent, because to me, it sounds like a lot more people are going to have to get the virus before we get that R naught value where we need it to be. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gold, appreciate that. We have a special guest joining you now on set. We were waiting for his arrival. As you can imagine out there in rural America, there's a reason why Lieutenant Governor Mike Foley of Nebraska has been busy. As you probably know, the governor of Nebraska is also the commander in chief of the Nebraska National Guard, and this has been a very busy time for them. Okay, we're gonna bring him into the conversation, but first, we wanna go to another call. Next up, it's Dee from California. She has two questions for you. Let's listen. I'm interested in the pros and cons regarding RNA versus DNA vaccines. Also, I would like to know, have the doctor addressed the negative effects of adjuvants in vaccines? Thank you very much. Gee, these are two uh, really sophisticated questions, and I'll do my best to uh, uh, answer them. But please understand that I'm a recovering cardiac surgeon and uh, somewhat limited in my scope of knowledge, but that's never stopped me from trying to be helpful. So uh, there are many different ways of developing vaccines, and they go back to the very early days of smallpox and, uh, you know, diphtheria, pertussis, mumps, measles. And of course, uh, the most recent development of uh, influenza vaccines, the work that's been done on Ebola vaccines uh, across the country and around the world. So the use of RNA uh, to develop the vaccine. Ah, 
looks like we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty, but we do ask you to stay with us. Coming up, not only are we going to be taking your phone calls, you saw him, he's on set now, Lieutenant Governor Mike Foley of Nebraska. We're going to find out what's happening in Nebraska and what we can glean from that experience for the rest of rural America. Stay with us. Much more to come. Rural Health Matters only on RFD TV, Rural America's most important network. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren, and we have quite the lineup for you tonight. Once again, joining us, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, and we also welcome Lieutenant Governor of Nebraska, Mike Foley. Thanks for joining us. And Lieutenant Governor Foley, I just wanted to start with you, if we can, bring you into this conversation. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you have been dealing with COVID-19 in Nebraska, because you're one of the states that really has some shining numbers to point out. We really do. You know, uh, Nebraskans should be very proud of the fact that um, we're very fortunate to be uh, living here where the University of Nebraska Medical Center is located. This is an extraordinary facility. And anytime I'm with Dr. Gold, I always learn so much. So it's a pleasure to be with him tonight. I'm stepping in and kind of a short notice to fill in for the governor, who's got some other uh, duties uh, that are pressing on him at this moment. But anyway, uh, here in Nebraska, fortunately, the, uh, the, the COVID-19 virus arrived a little bit later than it did perhaps in uh, the East Coast or West Coast. New York City, as we all know, was hit pretty hard. Los Angeles, San Francisco were hit pretty hard. But uh, it gave us a little bit of breathing time to, to ramp up and get ready. And I know the very first thing the governor did was to reach out to the experts at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Gold has assembled a team of experts, truly world-class experts, who have given us some fabulous advice. And they have a lot of expertise in infectious diseases. Many of, us, many of us would remember the, the, the Ebola scare just a few years ago. And some of those Ebola patients were actually brought here to the University of Nebraska Medical Center because we have the expertise and the, the facilities and so forth to deal with something as, as dangerous as, as that was. So we're very fortunate to have this expertise to rely on. And the governor reached out to them immediately and began having a number of meetings with them. I came out here myself and sat down with some, some pretty smart people at the Med Center and toured all of their facilities and was just so impressed with everything I saw. So it gave a chance to, to, to ramp up properly and to take the proper steps to prepare ourselves for what we knew was coming. It's interesting, you know, in, in uh, early February, I was asked to make a trip to South Korea and Japan on a trade mission. Uh, South Korea and Japan are both fabulous trading partners for our state. They buy literally hundreds of millions of dollars of our, of our beef in particular. They love our beef and our pork and they buy a lot of our ag products uh, all across the board. So we're visiting those two countries and talking to them about trade deals and so forth and the trading environment. And then the word broke that the, the, uh, the COVID virus was really uh, uh, as scary as some people had uh, thought it might be and it was now in the United States and we needed to start uh, ramping up and preparing for it. So we got back home pretty quick and I've been uh, at the governor's uh, side uh, literally every day with meetings with him at a distance. Uh, being very, very careful about this, that we don't both get it at the same time. And neither, neither of us have gotten, unfortunately. But um, anyway, I've been with him at meetings every day and on conference calls with him and in, in concert with uh, Dr. Anton, our chief medical officer, and the, the folks at the University Med Center, learning as much as we can about this uh, COVID-19 virus. And um, we took uh, some steps right away to implement uh, some directed health measures these are steps that we can take under emergency powers of the governor and working in concert with our community health centers and seeking their guidance, their input, because they're, they're the boots on the ground. And to start uh, implementing social distancing rules and so forth and uh, phasing in uh, certain restrictions on people, which, you know, nobody likes to do. We, we like our freedom. But you have to do it smart, too, and you have to protect the people. That's the first obligation of the government is to protect the people. So we took those steps right away. And it was all about trying to crush the curve, to make sure that when the curve did reach its peak, uh, that we would be prepared with all of our medical facilities, have enough personnel on board, have the proper uh, personal protective equipment, the PPE that we've earned, learned so much about in recent months, and to have the ventilators and all the, the right uh, pieces in place so that when people did catch this disease, they would be prepared to, uh, the medical folks would be prepared to, to, to deal with those who unfortunately would catch the disease. 
Obviously, the, the most vulnerable were the elderly and those with uh, some other underlying health conditions. Uh, and I think we've done a great job because of the cooperation of the people in Nebraska. I think we've done just a fabulous job of crushing that curve. Now, the virus is going to be with us for a while. We know that. And we can't let down our guard. We're going to very slowly and very gradually ease up on some of the restrictions. But the reality is this virus is going to be with us for some time until that uh, va magic uh, vaccine is developed. And that's going to take time, as we know. And when it does, we'll, we'll uh, want to get that and, and protect ourselves from the virus. But uh, we're just so lucky to be in Nebraska where we have the expertise to rely on. Absolutely. And, you know, strong governance, it's essential, absolutely essential in a crisis like this. And so it speaks volumes to your leadership as well. We don't want to get into this too much, but we have to address the fact that the governor is not with us tonight, Governor Pete Ricketts, because he's busy addressing riots and coronavirus concerns that have extended even to the nation's heartland into Nebraska. And I wanted to get your thoughts, Dr. Gold, if possible, as to how this could contribute impact what's already happening when it comes to the spread of the virus? Well, let me start off by saying, Christina, that the events of the last week are nothing short of tragic and that our thoughts and prayers uh, go out to everybody whose life has been touched and uh, the these continue to evolve uh, and we're here at the university are trying to be as thoughtful and as helpful as we possibly can. Uh, and at the same time, monitor the continued spread of the virus in our community. But, you know, let's face it, these large public gatherings, many of individuals are or are not wearing masks. Some of them could be asymptomatically carrying the virus. Others have been exposed to individuals who are carrying the virus. And I think while it's certainly not a foregone conclusion, we have to be prepared for the fact that this may ex accelerate the spread of the virus. And particularly uh, as it represents individuals in some of our uh, underserved communities, access to testing, uh, contact tracing, access to good quality health care is going to be really, really important. You know, if you look at this graphic, you can see the number of cases going back to the very, very beginning in early March uh, that are recorded uh, across the United States. And, you know, we're seeing a slow uh, but gradual decline in the number of new cases. And the, the curve is a much steeper decline in the large coastal cities and a much slower decline uh, in uh, rural America. And if we shift to the next graphic, it looks not just at the cases, but it actually looks at the amount of death that has occurred. And fortunately, the number of deaths are also falling uh, quite rapidly across our nation still have not gotten down uh, to the zero level. But uh, in the rural and uh, communities in, this, in the Midwest and in other parts of the nation, and particularly in our farming and ranching communities, we need to be particularly vigilant. Uh, if you look at this graphic, it looks at the rate of spread uh, across the United States. And what you see in a lot of the concentrated coastal communities, there's still reasonable rate of spread. But you're seeing that spread inward uh, to the United States uh, breadbasket. And, you know, as Lieutenant Governor said a few minutes ago, what started off earlier on our coastal communities and larger urban cities are now continuing to spread uh, inward. Uh, and so, uh, you, know, I, you know, I've been communicating very closely uh, with the governor, with our public health individuals, and working not only to provide as much assistance uh, as it relates to all of these large public gatherings and protests and other such things, but also to start to become aware and, if necessary, predict what, what may happen if we start to see a significant uptick in the spread of the virus. You know, as Lieutenant Governor Foley said, we've been very fortunate here in Nebraska and our surrounding states. We've had a really good partnership between our elected officials, the university, and many others in order to share quality information. We're now at a time that we have to be prepared uh, for another resurgence uh, accelerated uh, due to these unfortunate and tragic situations. Mm.
You know, so more to come. More to come. You talk about a gradual decline in the virus in rural America. You couple that with a sharp economic decline, and now you follow it up with the civil unrest. This is a really, really hard time for all of us, but I couldn't even imagine what it would be like knowing that the weight of keeping a community safe is, is under my authority. Tell me a little bit about that process, Lieutenant Governor Foley, if you will, and what this has been like for you. Well, one of the one of the great uh, uh, problems, of course, is the uh, economic impact that we've had on so many people. We had, I think, 130,000 people file for unemployment benefits uh, in a very, very short period of time. That, that represents about three years worth of unemployment claims being processed now by, by our Department of Labor. That puts a tremendous stress on so many families, just adding to the, the virus situation. Uh, and this, they lose their health insurance and exactly. all of the rest of that goes yes. out the window. Yes, absolutely. It's been a very, very difficult time for so many families and people who spent literally their whole lives building businesses, it's very successful businesses, employing many people, saw those businesses just go up in smoke in a short period of time. Now, the federal government stepped in with some resources, and that's going to be very helpful to us. Um, the unemployment benefits uh, have been rather generous, and that's good. They, deserve, they should be. And there's other programs in place now to help businesses, uh, to keep them up, uh, going, uh, to, re to, to uh, recover some of the losses that they've incurred. But nonetheless, there's tremendous stress among the people of Nebraska today. Our farmers and ranchers, of course, are hurting very much uh, in farming today and in, in, in livestock production. It's, it's a just-in-time type of uh, operation where your, your cattle come to, to market and your hogs and so forth come to market just at the right time, just when the, when the, house, the packing houses can take them, accept them, and, and process them. And, of course, that's been disrupted, causing a lot of stress and anxiety to, uh, to the most important industry in our state, which is agriculture. So it's been a tough time. But fortunately, with, with federal resources and with good management and help from the university system, we're going to get through this. Um, and we'll, we'll bounce back stronger than ever, but it's just going to take some time and some patience. So I just urge folks, hang in there. We, we know the problems. We're with you. We're, we're going to get those resources to you. And, uh, but we, and we know how difficult this is for everyone in our state right now. Absolutely. Around the entire country and around the world, it, that's, it's this collective stress that we've all been experiencing. And then on top of that, we can't get out of the house and do the things that we used to do to de-stress, which brings us to our next question. Jeff from Georgia, he has a question about an annual tradition for many in the ag community. Let's listen. Do you think it will be safe to attend farm shows in the fall? You know, Jeff, uh, unclear. I think a lot is going to depend on the nature of the farm show and what the situation is with the spread of the virus uh, in the fall. Uh, we are predicting that the number of new cases per day, the amount of hospitalization, the percent of positive tests per day, which are the metrics that we look at most closely, are going to continue to fall, fall and decrease as we get closer to the uh, to the fall and into the winter months. But a lot of that's going to depend what's going on in your community. So I would say that if the numbers continue to go down in your community and you can maintain some safe social distancing, then I would say it's okay as long as you plan appropriately. You may or may not need to continue to be wearing a mask at that time. Uh, I don't know. But you know, uh, as we like to say, uh, hope is not a plan. So we plan for the worst and hope for the best here. So you need multiple different contingencies. But I've seen a number of uh, meetings that I attend every year uh, that are hosted in the early fall that are now being converted into digital only. So I think people are getting the idea that while things may be a lot better in the fall, particularly the early fall, uh, we're not going to be quite ready to go back to business as usual. All right. Thanks for that. Next up, we have Annabelle from Nebraska. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Uh, my question has to do with the way the numbers are posted of the confirmed cases, the deaths, and the recovered cases. And there's a huge disparity when you add the deaths and the recovered cases uh, and compare it to the confirmed cases, what's the story on the rest of the confirmed cases? Are those people that are still ill with it, or, or what uh, is the situation? 
So first of all, Annabelle, thank you so much for calling us from the uh, wonderful state of Nebraska. It's, uh, it's great to have a fellow <laughs> Nebraskan uh, on the phone with us tonight. Uh, so uh, the answer to your question is, is uh, pretty straightforward. Those are individuals that we either have not confirmed through public health surveys that have recovered or are still infected. And uh, what we've learned about this virus is that while the, of those that we know are infected, uh, that some of them uh, will get better in you know, five, seven, 10 days, but others will still have lagging symptoms that will go on for weeks or even a month, maybe even a little longer than that. We had one individual recently who was still short of breath and had aches and pains that went on for six weeks, uh, even though we couldn't recover any virus in repeated testing from the individual. And so I think that's really the answer to what's happened. You know, and don't forget, the largest uh, number of cases that have been ticking up, you know, in the United States has really only been since uh, early to mid-March. And certainly, Annabelle, uh, I don't remember the date of our first case in Nebraska, but it certainly was, you know, somewhat later than that, uh, Mike, don't you think? It was, yeah, for sure. And so uh, we're still collecting the data. Uh, so, no, there's no magical uh, thing that's happened to those individuals. They haven't disappeared, but they're somewhere between, uh, you know, confirmed well and still symptomatic. Hopefully they don't end up on the mortality side of the equation. And we know, by the way, Annabelle, if it's any reassurance to you, they're not in our hospitals because we know exactly how many people are hospitalized at any given time. So they're probably still in the recovery stages. If I can just add to Dr. Gold's comments, uh, I know a couple of people who've, who've been through the COVID-19 experience, so to speak, and they had the disease and they've, they've worked their way through it. They stayed home and they're, they're feeling fine now. And so that's uh, kind of the upside to the story here is that most of the people who will get this virus will be just fine at home. They'll have a really bad flu for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, and then maybe perhaps some lingering uh, circumstances. But for the most part, they're not going to need hospitalization. Now, if you're older, if you have underlying health conditions, that's a whole other story. That's a much more serious event if you happen to contract the disease. But most of us who are maybe a little bit younger and a little bit healthier, uh, contracting the disease is, is not a death sentence whatsoever. It's going to be just a really bad flu of sickness, which we'll be able to get through. And you know, uh, Mike, what, you know, there's some recent research that's come out that says based on uh, asymptomatic surveillance in some of the communities that's now coming in. <clears throat> we originally thought the mortality rates uh, were in the uh, one to one and a half, maybe even two percent rate, uh, and we're now actually seeing that it's far less than that. Really? And that it's uh, it's either 0.5 or 0.51 or something roughly in that area. And I'm going to guess that over time it's going to turn out to be even lower. Well, that's so. That's, I mean, that's all really good news. That's great news. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. Absolutely. Thank you for that call, Annabelle, from Nebraska. We appreciate that. Our next question comes from social media. It's from Eugenia of Colorado. She says, I'm the oldest member of our third generation ranch family. We're concerned about school returning this fall because COVID-19 and the flu share similar symptoms. Are there any approved preventative drugs for COVID or the flu? Uh, so there are really no good preventative drugs uh, for the flu. Uh, there's always Tamiflu, which has been around for some time now, and uh, it's been shown to be effective for individuals who either are in the very early stages of an ILI, influenza-like illness, uh, or uh, think they were exposed and, uh, and choose to take it. Uh, it either will prevent the flu or, more commonly, produce a much milder case. And don't forget, you know, in a bad flu year, uh, there are millions and millions of Americans that do get infected, uh, even if uh, there's an appropriately good vaccine that is available. Uh, there is no uh, FDA approved or, uh, or even uh, emergency use authorization uh, approved or used uh, <clears throat> preventative uh, for COVID-19 right now. Of course, been uh, a lot of talk about the use of quinine-like drugs, uh, hydroxyquinolone and, and other such drugs. And there are a number of research trials that are actively ongoing, both here in the United States and around the world right now. Uh, it's been shown pretty clearly 
that it's not helpful in advanced cases, but it may have some use in prevention or, or in early uh, treatment. Uh, if you look at vaccine development schedules, you know, uh, originally it was thought that it would take uh, until 2022 in order to get an approved uh, series of vaccines available to be distributed across the United States. Uh, I am actually more optimistic than that. I think we're going to have some EUA emergency use authorization approved vaccines. I'm hoping by the Christmas holidays uh, that, or maybe slightly thereafter. Uh, there's a number that are currently in clinical trials across the United States. And I don't know if you know this, Lieutenant Governor, but we're going to be uh, leading a trial in one of the new vaccines uh, I was here, not aware of that. That's uh, great. In the very near future as well. So uh, I think that's positive news, and we're just going to have to, you know, keep track of this as it continues to evolve. Now, influenza and, uh, and COVID uh, may uh, come on and may feel very similar to individuals early on in the disease. The difference, however, is that influenza is a much shorter duration illness. It typically is much more marked by nasal and throat congestion, uh, aches and pains, whereas COVID is much more associated with shortness of breath and, and really deep pneumonia, with probably a tenfold need of hospitalization greater uh, for COVID than, uh, uh, than for influenza. So to your question, Eugenia, it's going to be really important as the flu season starts that, one, we all get our flu shots, and secondly, that if we're not sure of whether we have COVID or have the flu, that we do get tested because hopefully there'll be a very different course and different amount of monitoring that'll have to be in place. You know, I'm, I'm happy to hear Dr. Gold speak so uh, optimistically about the development of a vaccine. It doesn't surprise me that the University of Nebraska Medical Center would be in the forefront of the development of that vaccine. It doesn't surprise me at all. But, you know, in anticipation of that day when that uh, vaccine finally arrives, we all just need to con continue to practice just good hygiene, washing our hands constantly, using hand sanitizer, practicing appropriate social distancing, wearing masks when we're in close proximity with people like shopping and so forth, and just using good common sense. And we can protect ourselves and uh, protect those that we interact with. So uh, just great to hear that uh, Dr. Gold is, uh, is as optimistic as he is regarding the development of the vaccine, because that's really ultimately what we're going to need. We're going to need a vaccine to, to protect ourselves from this disease. That's right. He's not trying to butter us up either. He's always been completely <laughs> transparent with us throughout this entire experience. I've got to ask you, though, Lieutenant Governor Foley, governors had to try to retail to tailor their reopening plans to each state's specific needs, trying to mitigate the impact on smaller populations right along with the big cities in many cases. Talk about what that process looked like and how Dr. Gold and UNMC played a role. Well, it's a complicated story, as you know, because Nebraska has a couple of major population centers, Lincoln and Omaha, but we have hundreds of smaller communities uh, sprinkled all across our state. And life in Broken Bow or Cozad, Nebraska, is very different from downtown Omaha. It's just a different life experience and different threats uh, imposed on them. So we're trying to write directed health measures that make common sense for the entire state. Uh, one, one thing that I, I noticed uh, taking effect today, in fact, was my son, a 17-year-old high school student at Lincoln Pius High School, is now playing baseball for the first time this season. Uh, ordinarily, by this time of year, he would have gotten in several dozen games and many, many hours of practice. Well, tonight's their first night of practice. He's thrilled, and on uh, June 18th, he'll have his first baseball game of the year. Kind of late to get started, but he's thrilled to be able to do that. So that's something we had to phase in very, very slowly and carefully. But I think with, with proper social distancing, they, the kids can get out and play some baseball. And I know the golfers are doing pretty well because you can, you're outside and you can have that, that appropriate distancing. So the, the golfers have done pretty well. But uh, soccer players, not so much, because soccer players tend to bunch up a little bit more and have uh, closer contact, ba basketball players as well. So it, it, it's all a question of uh, trying to be prudent, trying to be reasonable, and, and talking to the experts, being in constant communication with our directed health measure uh, experts at the community health centers and with the university folks, and, and just doing uh, gradually easing up and, and moving into this uh, very, very gradually, and watching those numbers, watching those numbers very, very carefully to make sure that we don't have uh, a spike 
that we're going to have to deal with in our health care system. So far, our health care systems have stepped up. They've been prepared. And they've, they've handled everybody who's needed hospitalization or any kind of medical treatments. They've been able to get first-class um, medical treatments as needed. Yeah, you know, these are your communities. This is where your family lives. And so that speaks volumes that that June 18th game, when your son has his first game, he's excited about it. And you know you wouldn't put him out on that field unless you thought that he was safe. And so that says a lot right there. Absolutely. Our, yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. I hope they win it. James of Indiana, he says, now that planting is wrapped up, we're trying to plan a family trip that includes taking a flight. When do you think it will be okay for us to go if we take precautions like wearing masks and social distancing? Well, James, you know, we, we get all kinds of mixed answers to that question. And uh, <clears throat> uh, as you may or may not know, uh, I had the opportunity to, to take an airplane trip about a week ago, and, uh, and it was like no airplane trip that I have ever taken. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, people, gathered and sat at, at tremendous social distance uh, in the boarding <clears throat> areas. Uh, there was uh, single file and markedly spaced out uh, distances on the jet bridges. And then the uh, seatings uh, on the planes uh, were sort of like a checkerboard, you know, sort of every other seat, mm -hmm. every other row, uh, greeted by the flight attendants uh, with a package of hand sanitizer uh, and, uh, and some wipes. Uh, uh, you know, I've never seen the airports uh, cleaner, uh, the planes cleaner, uh, et cetera. Uh, I did it because uh, there were certain members of my family that I hadn't seen in a while, and uh, I really <clears> felt <throat> the need to do it uh, <clears throat> over the weekend. Uh, but I, you know, and obviously I'm feeling well and, uh, and have a very positive attitude about it. But my advice to you, particularly if you're older, uh, if you have uh, some uh, so-called comorbidities, what we call in the vulnerable group, high blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, uh, any of those things being treated for cancer or <clears throat> some immunologic disease if you're on a lot of different medications. Uh, my advice would be to postpone the travel as long as you can reasonably postpone <clears throat> it. You know, uh, obviously uh, many, many family events. I mean, a day doesn't go by that I don't hear about a wedding that's being postponed or some other graduation event or some other celebratory family events uh, that are getting postponed till later in the fall or even for a year. Uh, I understand the justice of the peace is awful busy these days, that people are getting married without ceremonies, uh, and they'll put the ceremony off for uh, a later time uh, in the future. I don't know, if you had any experience in the airports, uh, Lieutenant? I have Governor? not traveled. In fact, um, interestingly, my, my oldest sister, Kathy, just passed away from a long battle of leukemia. She, she died in Connecticut a month ago. And um, it was a sad situation, obviously, to lose a, a sibling. But to add to the, to the sadness was the fact that the family members who are scattered around the United States were not able to travel to Connecticut to be with her in her final days. And there could be no funeral because uh, no one felt safe to travel at that time. Now this summer we'll we have a family, family gathering, we'll have a special service for her to remember her and, and have a proper uh, a, a burial situation and so forth. So this has put a lot of strain on, on families uh, because of the postponement of weddings and not being able to travel to visit uh, sick relatives and dying relatives, not be able to, to attend funerals and so forth. It's just put a lot of stress and uh, discomfort on people because people just don't feel safe traveling yet. Um, I think we're going to get through this uh, in terms of the travel situation. I think things are going to get better. The, oh, for sure. The, the airlines are, are getting their act together. And, uh, you know, as Dr. Gold said, they've probably never been as clean as they are right now. Um, so they're taking all kinds of precautions. And people are being very, very good about being very sensible about how they travel and have, practicing good hygiene and social distancing and so forth. And, but it's just going to take time for all of us to get our comfort levels up so we feel uh, safe to, to get on those planes. And and start resuming something that resume, uh, looks like a normal lifestyle again. You know, I will say the good news was mm. is there was no traffic in any of the airports. Yeah. There was no line at security, uh, th nothing. I mean, it was just sort of a uh, breeze through, or yeah, not, sure. uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess, because yeah. uh, certainly the airline industry has taken a huge financial hit. Oh, they have. They certainly have.
Whew, my condolences for the loss of your sister, Kathy. That is a, that's a hard one right now. A lot of people have been going through those times. And Dr. Gold, I'm so happy to hear that you finally got to see your family. We know that you missed many, many experiences with them throughout this. And you've been here with us the whole time. We're going to pause for a quick break, but our phone lines are open. 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this, including more of your phone calls calls. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, Dr. Jeffrey Gold. We also welcome the Lieutenant Governor of Nebraska, Mike Foley. Our next question comes from Tara of Montana, and she says, before the virus hit, nearly half of rural hospitals were already operating in the red. Now, as the economy worsens, are you hearing anything about the outlook for rural hospitals and bankruptcies? Well, this has been a very, very stressful time for our rural hospitals. You know, when it became necessary to protect our personal protective equipment, we had to put a stop to elective surgeries. And um, elective surgeries is a, a, a very, very important component to the financial viability of all hospitals, in particular the rural hospitals. So this put an extraordinary strain on our rural health facilities. And uh, we need to, of course, the, the ban on, on the elective surgeries has been lifted now. And, they can resume those practices. So hopefully the financial picture will turn around quickly for those rural facilities because we don't want to lose any of them. They're all critically important to the state of Nebraska and we don't want to lose even one of them. So, you know, we've, I was just looking at the numbers for our healthcare system uh, here in, uh, in Omaha uh, and we're on the inpatient side of the equation. We're at about 79 to 80 percent back to mm. uh, where we would normally be this time of year, not counting the COVID patients that we house. Yeah. The interesting thing is on the outpatient side, you know, routine, uh, you know, sports physicals and things of that nature, we're still pretty down. So mm. I guess people that need their knee replaced or, uh, you know, need to get an endoscopy or a cardiac cath are, are coming in, but the, the routine outpatient stuff is still not quite... Uh, return back to normal. Mm, yeah. But on a week by week basis, it does continue to build. And I think the message is really clear is that our healthcare systems are safe, that there's not, I mean, I was just looking at our numbers, which hard to believe, but in the last 90 days, given every single patient we've cared for, we've had exactly two staff members uh, who were confirmed to have uh, to contract COVID 19 as a result of their work. I mean, that mm. is unheard of yeah. compared to the experience that we've had, you know, in New York and in California and in other large cities. Yeah. And it's just a testament to the safety <clears throat> of the environment. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing statistic. Well, as you say, Doctor, it's a question of people getting their confidence back and realizing that um, these, these hospitals are very, very safe facilities. They've, they've got the expertise and the knowledge and so forth to know how to administer and de deliver medical services and do it in a safe way that protects themselves and protects the patients that are walking And there's in. another very important point here, Christina, and, and that is that if parents have deferred immunization, uh, if women are deferring mammography, uh, if uh, individuals are referring their five-year colonoscopy uh, or any of these other routine screening and preventive measures, we're actually going to be causing much more medical damage uh, to the community. Uh, and so this is a time to really start to think about what some of those missing pieces have been. And uh, I just want to underscore uh, that there is a very, very uh, high degree of safety in starting to reach out back to your primary care provider or wherever you would go to get your routine cancer screening, uh, checkups, et cetera, uh, prescription renewals, even if it's done by telehealth, uh, this is the time to do it. Okay, thank you very much for that. Our next question is from Randy of Oklahoma. He's concerned about potential hot spots. He says, I'd like to know about the measures being taken to control the spread of coronavirus in rural areas with prisons and jails. Well, yes, that's a great question because in our, our prisons, of course, you've got a captive population and uh, the, the workers coming in day in and day out could, in theory, bring that disease into, into a very controlled population, which could really add to the stress of the, of the matter. So we have been very, very vigilant about making sure that every 
person who works in our facilities is properly uh, examined and tested and so forth and monitored for any symptoms that they might have and to make sure that we don't bring that disease into the facility. Now, we have had a couple of prison workers who've tested positive for the virus, and we immediately segregate those workers, make sure that they're not in with the, that they stay home until they're, they're cleared for duty, and um, making sure that it doesn't get inside that prison, those prison walls, because it's, it's tough enough to run a prison these days without having to deal with the coronavirus on top of it. You know, we learned from the Diamond Princess uh, cruise ship experience that uh, long-term care facilities, uh, senior citizen facilities, daycare facilities, uh, prisons uh, are sort of like mini cruise ships in many ways, meaning yeah. they're yeah. self-contained. And so who gets in, who gets out, how much testing is available, uh, contact tracing is absolutely critical. And so all of these precautions, uh, as you've seen uh, in this really nice video, uh, looking at the National Guard with all the precautions of social distancing, good hand hygiene, uh, are critically, critically important. Yeah, one of the first things we had to do with, with, with respect to our prisons was to ban uh, visitors from coming in. And of course, when you're an incarcerated inmate, uh, having a family member come and visit you gives you hope for the future and gives you some encouragement to, uh, to comply with all the prison regulations and so forth and behave yourself so you can get out. And uh, without having those family members able to come in and visit with you and give you that encouragement, that's, that's added to their, their difficulties. But that's just the reality of the world we're living in right now. You just can't have visitors coming in off the street and, and potentially bringing in this disease. And that's also been true with, with respect to the people that are in our long-term care facilities, our nursing homes. It's, it's made life very, very difficult for them not to have family members come and physically visit with them and give them hope and encouragement. Well, we have been getting a little bit of good news as far as the science behind how the virus is spreading. And that brings us to our next question. It's from Jenny of Louisiana. She says, we've been getting our groceries delivered in northern Louisiana and disinfecting everything. If the risk of surface spread is now said to be lower, is that process still necessary? Uh, yeah, Jenny, uh, great question. So I would say the risk has now been shown to be lower for what's called surface contact. And that means everything from uh, vanity countertops to doorknobs uh, to uh, kitchen utensils uh, and also, of course, to mail, uh, groceries and other such things. So, yeah, the, I think it's pretty clear from some of the data <laughs> that the, you can still recover viral fragments from those surfaces but the infectivity rate, that is to say the chance of actually getting infected from that viral fragment, is significantly lower than if you're with somebody who's coughing or sneezing or what we call in the trade shedding live virus. So I wish I could tell you that there's no risk and you don't need to be concerned about it at all. And hopefully in the not so distant future we'll be able to say that. Uh, but right now I would say you still need to have an abundance of caution uh, you know, a uh, quick wipe is not a bad idea. If you can let the mail sit on the, on the table overnight just to be sure that it's not been handled uh, recently. Uh, you know, for me, uh, if I can have an extra day or two without opening that phone bill or, or other bill, that's, that's okay for me and my family. Uh, you know, so Jenny, I would say an abundance of caution, you still want to be safe. You know, someone uh, earlier used the phrase hot spot. It's interesting how things can change so quickly. We went through a process in Nebraska of reopening all of our houses of worship on a, on a limited basis uh, with, with proper social distancing and so forth. And it, it required a lot of conversation with faith leaders all across our state. We got things back open again. And then there was a major religious event in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, a week ago, where a priest, a Catholic priest, visited from Philadelphia participated in a religious ceremony, then went back home to Philadelphia and realized that he had the, the disease. Sent word back to Lincoln, and immediately four of our largest Catholic parishes in Lincoln shut down for the weekend, just out of an abundance of caution, not knowing if anybody might have contracted this disease from this uh, man who was visiting from Philadelphia. I mean, that's just what we have to do. This, we're gonna, there's going to be these kind of flare-ups from time to time as we realize that people attended an event where there were many people in attendance and somebody had the disease, and boom, you got to take uh, those steps to, to shut back down again and reset. 
Uh, so it's all about watching the numbers and, and, and watching who's contracted the disease and making sure that we have proper contact tracing to know who might have been in contact with someone who now has confirmed to, to have had the disease. And I saw that firsthand in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, this just this past weekend with the closing of our four largest Catholic parishes. Oof. You really can never be too cautious. It's like Dr. Gold has pointed out on this show before, just waiting, just waiting to save lives is going to be worth it in the long run. We just have to hold on a little bit longer. I do have to ask, though, what actions has your state taken to ensure that rural and remote areas, like you talked about, are getting as many resources and the preparation as we're seeing in some of the more metropolitan areas? How, how do you make that balance work? That's, that's a great question. In fact, uh, the governor's launched something called Test Nebraska. It's a website you can go to and you can sign on, and I've, I've done it myself. You sign on and you, you indicate your age. In my case, I'm over age 65, so that automatically triggers an invitation to me to get a test. And I've done that, and it's, it, it's not, it's, you know, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Not, it's not bad. And I've had a test, and it uh, came out negative, thank God. But uh, that test is not just available in Lincoln and Omaha. It's available in all of our rural communities. We're, we're taking that test on the road, so to speak, to make sure it's available to people all across our state. We want people to feel comfortable knowing that they don't have the disease. And, and if they do, that we want them to know that as well so they can get the proper care and treatments. So it's, it's very, very important that we, that we uh, make sure that the resources are available, not just Lincoln and Omaha, but all the rural communities that are so prevalent in a state like Nebraska. And there are 20 local public health districts across the state. That's right. And each of them has their own specific local program. And the majority of them, of course, are in uh, very rural communities that serve our ranching uh, and farming uh, population. That's correct. And so they have programs that are specific to those rural communities. And so I, I do think, you know, at least my best ability to tell is that there's a pretty healthy distribution of testing, contact tracing, availability of personal protective equipment, and hopefully, as we get closer to the availability of vaccines, we'll have a method of rolling that out that serves both our rural and our urban communities. And in addition to that, all the federal resources that are coming now into play, the CARES Act funding, the unemployment benefit funding, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, these are available all across our state. And in fact, Nebraska is one of the leading states in the nation in terms of getting our businesses to sign up for that Paycheck Protection Program, which has been a great help to a lot of businesses to kind of tide them over through this tough time so they can resume their businesses back to normal as quickly as possible. Okay. You know, that's something that we all want. This has been such a, a tough stretch of time, and it just seems to be snowballing out of control right now for many of us. As we take all of this in and we move into the rest of our week, I was wondering, Dr. Gold, if you would leave us with some final thoughts, potentially speaking to the times that we're currently living in. I would just close by saying uh, tonight that uh, while I understand there's a lot of stress in our communities on many, many different levels, uh, as uh, Lieutenant Governor Foley said, we are definitely going to get through this. We are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're getting much closer to effective antivirals. We're getting closer to a vaccine. We're understanding the spread of the virus patterns a lot better. And we just need to hold on. You know, uh, that, that's the name of the game. Just hold on tight. The, do your very best to protect yourself and your family, and that's how we're going to protect others. All right. We just keep on going through this storm together. I want to thank you both. I know how important the time that you're granting us is to both of you, UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold, and of course, Nebraska Lieutenant Governor Mike Foley. Thank you so much. If you'd like more information about our panelists, you can head to rfdtv.com. If you'd like more resources on COVID-19, head to nebraskamed.com. And stick around. At 8 o'clock tonight on Rural America Live, we're going to talk with the owner of Total Feeds. Dr. Harry Anderson. You'll learn more about his lineup of products that can help you and your animal reach peak performance. That's all tonight, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, right here on RFD TV, Rural America's most important network. I want to thank you for joining us, wishing you and your family a beautifully blessed night. We'll get through this together.